Now, this next lesson is focusing on the modern period again uh, for medicines through time, looking at the prevention <coughs> of disease in this period. Now, preventing disease is something that for this period continues down the line of the government intervention. The government had a huge part to play in prevention of disease in this period. Um, if anything, you could argue they're the driving force behind it. Whereas we know that the government only really started getting involved following the Public Health Act and maybe a little bit before that in 1875. But the government were a real driving force in this period because they realised the importance of keeping the population happy, especially as more people were starting to gain the vote. So the first thing we're going to look at is this Change for Life campaign. Now you could write a paragraph about this in a prevention question in modern. So the Change for Life campaign was something created by the government as a way of intervening with people's lifestyle choices. Now, if we have a look, the Change for Life campaign is focusing on swapping your sugar intake or understanding how much sugar that you should be having based on your age group every day. This is a way for the government to try and prevent illnesses such as diabetes and also to prevent possibly in a, 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 you know, an issue with um, people's weight in the country. If you have a look at the bottom here, it says for four to six years old, you should have five cubes of sugar a day, 19 grams. On top of this, food, food organisations have started to make it easier for people to track the amount of sugar they're eating because on the front of most packaging now, it has a breakdown of the sugar, of the fat that, every, that there is in certain meals or certain um, types of food. Now this, this campaign would benefit a range of people. Now firstly, it's to ensure that children will grow up being taught the correct sort of possible ways to live their life. This is really important to ensure that when they become adults, they don't go down difficult lifestyle choices, which means that they could get sick in the long run. Likewise, it's really important for children to be raised with the correct amount of food, uh, the food intake to ensure they have a, a, a strong developmental growth, but also just to make sure that they don't, re don't become ill early on in their life. Likewise, it's really important, especially with sugar, to be able to help with your dentistry, your teeth, which is important to make sure there's no problems when you're older. So there's lots of benefits to this Change for Life campaign. There's lots of adverts. It's not just about sugar. It's also about um, under 100 calorie snacks that they've discussed. But it is about one thing. They have a general consensus to prevent you from getting sick with a range of different illnesses. So... In this period, we're, we're looking at improvement and continuing problems in treatment and access to care. This is more of an overview of last lesson before we look at the preventative methods. So, I'm going to put improvements as a number one. Continuing problems, number two. So, 1900, 25% of deaths were caused by infectious disease. By 1990, it was down to less than one. That's an improvement. Infectious diseases were down significantly. This is because of the development of public health. New diseases keep appearing, which do not respond to any chemical treatments. So that's a continuing problem, as we mentioned last lesson. Microbes evolve uh, to beat some cures. Development of drug-resistant bacteria, such as MRSA. That's a continuing problem. People move from herbal remedies to a wide variety of specific effective medicines matched with diseases they have been proven to treat. That's an improvement. Lifestyle factors increase in illness, such as heart disease and cancer. There's no certain cure, so that's a continuing problem that people's lives are having an impact on their overall health. In 1900, most sick people were cared for at home by women. However, by 1990, the government set up the Ministry of Health to determine the level of health care across the country. That's an improvement. The Ministry of Health significantly helps in terms of the level of health care that each area of the country gets to make sure it's up to scratch. Difficult to vaccinate against viruses as they are constantly evolving. That's a problem, as we said, the flu. The NHS made medical services free at the point of impact. That's an improvement. And hospitals became a place for treating the sick. It was no longer a place for elderly to rest. This le left a gap in the services. This is one and two. The fact that hospitals kept playing a place for treating the sick is a positive, 
but the fact that the elderly there was no real place for them to now rest and recuperate um, especially with the demands of the NHS needing as many beds as possible that causes problems so now we've gone through this I want you to answer these two questions which was the most significant improvement to treatment and access to care and why and then three lifestyle factors that can cause cancer you pause the video here and then we can move on to the main bulk of this lesson looking at preventative methods so how the prevention of disease developed in this period as i've mentioned uh, government legislation really does develop oh, gov the government tend to have a part to play in all three of these we need to look at how my vaccines developed now remember after the work of edward jenner in 1798 and the later work of uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, we are now in a position where people are understanding how vaccines work and we have the scientific technology to be able to produce mass vaccines. We also have more of an understanding about lifestyle and we also have an understanding that the government are involved more and they need to make sure that not just the people have access to care, but that the world that they're living in, the country they're living in, is healthy. So, how is disease prevented? Now, this is really important that you understand. You've got to write three paragraphs for an explained paragraph. The government were involved because they lost their laissez-faire attitude. And there were reasons for this. First of all, the, the cause of disease was understood. The government realized that now that the cause of disease was understood, they could have, actually have an impact. And prevention methods were understood due to the cause being easier to understand. So, Prevention methods really, so for example, compulsory vaccination. The smallpox vaccine introduced by Edward Jenner was such an overwhelming success that there were lots of compulsory attempts in the 20th century. So the government started to enforce vaccines because they knew it would benefit the population. The passing laws to promote a clear environment, which we'll look at in a minute, the Clean Air Act, and communication of health risks. Now, a key example of this is the Ebola crisis of 2014, where the government tracked every traveler that came from a certain area that was affected by the Ebola crisis to prevent a spread. Charities also get more involved based on government funding by encouraging healthy lifestyle campaigns, such as the British Heart Foundation, who encourage people to give up smoking and exercise more to ensure that they have a strong heart for the longer that they live. So firstly, vaccinations. Now, vaccinations <clears throat> were vital to the prevention of illness, especially as there were campaigns to protect the whole population. Now, what needs to be understood is that before this period, local councils were in charge of vaccination. So they would be in charge of who got it, when they got it, why they got it. Problem was, some areas were richer than others. During the modern period, the government started to launch national campaigns. The government got involved to make sure that everyone got the same access to vaccinations to ensure that the country was healthier, prevented epidemics, to ensure that everyone had the best chance at being healthy. So you had the diphtheria campaign of 1942. Now this was a national campaign which was one of the first that the government attempted. As I said before, this local government would deal with it and they were not funded with the, by the main government which could cause problems because some local areas might be richer than others. And the national campaign for diphtheria helped with disease because diphtheria killed around 3,000 children a year. And during World War II, the government started to launch a national campaign to immunize all children against diphtheria. Now the reason for this is because during World War II, there were lots of people crammed into air shelters and the air raids, and because of this, the government realized that they needed to make sure that this wasn't going to be spread. So by immunizing children, it was going to help with diphtheria, especially as diphtheria impacted children the most. And by the mid 1900s, diphtheria was seen as a disease of the past because the government was so insistent on making a national campaign. Another campaign was the polio vaccination. And this was a big change in the modern period. Polio is very contagious and it causes paralysis. So it can cause some people to not be able to walk. And there were around 8,000 cases a year in England in the 1950s. And the vaccine was developed, tried and tested in the 50s, and Britain had it in 1956, 
with an updated vaccine in 1962. This was then pushed out on a national scale. And by 1984, the cases of polio were over in England. So because of this government enforcement to have the vaccination, it was really important that these real problematic conditions such as polio and diphtheria became a thing of the past. Furthermore, you also had some vaccines that were aimed at protecting future generations. So rubella, also known as German measles, it's not life-threatening for adults, but for pregnant women, it can cause damage to their unborn child. So some adults had rubella vaccination to make sure that their unborn child was not impacted by a condition that could harm them. And in this period as well, we have vaccines that focus on diseases that can lead to other issues. So for example, the HPV vaccination, <laughs> a, a, a vaccine that's really um, that's rolled out now quite commonly, even across schools, I believe year nine have this, protects women against infection from STI that links to cervical cancer. So there's this ongoing process to understand how people can be protected. And the fact that vaccines are being developed means there's more protection against illness, which number one is going to lead to less people dying, and number two is going to take pressure off um, institutes like the National Health Service. You also have government laws. Now we're going to look at prevention and lung cancer in a couple of lessons time. But one law the government did pass was about looking at the environment for the people. Now the government did pass a law in 1875, as we know, the Public Health Act. But in 1956 and 1968, the government passed the Clean Air Act which was a way of preventing smog in London, which was very heavy fog that could have serious impact on people's lungs. Now, the government is still focusing today on lowering the emission rate in the air. And the government look at lowering car emissions, so they're banning certain cars that produce high CO2 emissions to ensure that the air pollution remains low. And this is especially in certain areas, such as cities like London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool. And we'll talk about this a lot later on, but smoking laws have been put in place to prevent people getting sick. Um, in 2007, it became law that you were not allowed to smoke in public places such as pubs, cafes and nightclubs, those sorts of places to ensure that people will still could go into an environment and remain healthy. And that really is a focus as well on children as well, especially if they're in a cafe or restaurant and people were smoking, it could be quite damaging for them. And then government lifestyle campaigns. The government provides a significant amount of money to help, to help with campaigns. So advertising campaigns, which warns against, warns against danger to health, smoking, binge drinking, drug use. Things like Stoptober, which encourage people to stop smoking for a month. They think that this habit change might lead to a further prevention in them stopping something that could make them quite ill later on. Change for Life campaign, which we start mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. And Dry January, the idea that after Christmas, people stop drinking for a month to be able to allow their body to recover from a period in which drinking is seen as um, the norm over a certain amount of time in Christmas period. And this helps with lifestyle impact of health, which could lead to people changing things for the better. So, for example, Stoptober might mean, mean that some people think, oh, I saved a lot of money this month. I'm going to stop smoking. I mean, the role of vaping becomes quite important here. I mean, because some people do stop, but there are some scientific arguments about whether vaping is good for you or not. Um, but I guess it does change a habit in which smoking causes a lot of um, cases of lung cancer in the general population. You've now got enough to answer this question. Explain why there was a rapid pro there there was rapid progress, not rapid progress in disease prevention after 1900. You may use the following, government legislation, vaccines, lifestyle campaigns. You can write a whole paragraph on change for life if you were able to explain how that helps prevent illness. Likewise with national vaccinations, diphtheria and polio. This question, you might find it really hard to get the three lots of evidence explained, but remember, that's just us being over the top. One, one lot of evidence explained in each paragraph can get you the 12 marks. But if it's wrong, be careful because it could wipe out the paragraph. So two 
is safe. Three is ambitious. Just remember with that, with that structure, it's the way in which we try and force you to go one step above to get those top marks. But just as a, a end to the lesson, there are a load of keywords here. Be quite nice. This is about all sorts of things of the course. So, for example, 300. If you see the number 300, you should be thinking, well, how does that link to medicine? Right, I know. It's the amount of ideas that Vesalius disproved of games. You should be able to link all of these, or not link them, but you should be able to explain how all of these relate to the medicine course. So as a little end to the lesson, see if you can see how many you can do to link to the medicine course.